that's a necessary corrective to the insistence that the highest moral virtue for a modern man is harmlessness, which is absurd. Women don't even like harmless men, they hate them. They like to <laughs> claw them apart. You know, what, what women want are dangerous men who are civilized. And they want to help civilize them. <laughs> That's Beauty and the Beast. So, you know, I'll tell you a funny story, and only engineers could have come up with this, because they're the only ones that have the unparalleled blindness to social convention that would allow them to discover it. So, the Google engineers, I like engineers, by the way, because they're very straightforward. The Google engineers wrote a book a while back called A Billion Wicked Thoughts, which was a study of internet searches, billions of them, literally. And they were looking a lot at pornography use. And Well, there's lots known about male pornography use, partly, and it's easy to understand. I mean, males are, you know, pretty visually oriented, and what attracts them to pornography is fairly straightforward. Um, you can tell that if you look at graffiti in a men's washroom, you know, it's like <laughs> two circles and a triangle, and the men are absolutely transfixed by it. For women, the story is more complex. They use pornography too, but it tends to be literary, because women tend to like words more than they like visual stimuli. And so the Google guys tried to track down the archetypal structure of, well, they didn't use those words, of female pornography use. And so some of you know, how many of you know what a Harlequin romance is? Okay, okay, good. So th those are archetypal stories, right? That's the taming of the wild man, essentially, by the, by the desirable and virginal woman. And if you think women don't want that, then you better bloody well come up with an explanation for Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> right, which is the most, the most rapid-selling novel in human history. And emerged at exactly the same time that all of this noise about the, lack of, the absence of gender roles is, is being produced you know, en masse. It's like perfect female fantasy. It's exactly archetypally correct. It's Beauty and the Beast. So what the Google guys showed was the structure of Beauty and the Beast, although they didn't use that as a referent, that the female pornographic fantasy was wild guy, um, you know, somewhat careless about the wants and desires of others, attractive to everyone, therefore high status, tamed by the magic of a single woman and brought into a relationship with her. Okay, so, but here's the comical part. This just made me laugh, man. It was like, what were the five categories of most desirable male entity used most broadly in female pornography? Oh, it's so embarrassing. Women, you have to cover your head while I say this. Cause... Vampire. Werewolf. Billionaire. Surgeon. And pirate. So, in any coherent philosophy, there's an impetus to action. That's partly what makes the philosophy coherent, and postmodernism is a coherent philosophy. It has an impetus to action. Now, it's very difficult to describe the entire structure of postmodernism because it's fuzzy at the edges. It bleeds into other things. But imagine that there's a, there's a, core, of, uh, there's a core of central concerns. Now, imagine that most people who are nominally postmodernists only understand fragments of that core concern. And so, if you take the typical indoctrinated social justice warrior, third year women's studies student, you might say, well, she's only 15% postmodernist and 85% still human. <laughs> so, but if you, get, if you get 10 people like that together, 20 people like that together, each, there's enough of the postmodernist doctrine that fills the room because it's fragmented into different people, that you have a coherent spirit that animates the group. And it will act as if it has the intelligence of the philosophy. And it will manifest itself as if it's conspiratorial. Now, there are elements that are also conspiratorial, because people do things consciously as well. But you should always assume, assume stupidity before you assume organized malevolence. It keeps your, it keeps your thinking clear. It keep, because it's, it, like, it's not like there's no such thing as organized malevolence. But it's rare and it requires a lot of skill. Whereas sort of distributed stupidity, that can act conspiratorially without having to have a central agent. And, and so look there first and then, and only with great evidence, make the next set of presuppositions. So. The best, the best person to answer that is actually not me, it's my wife. <laughs> because she knows what I am, and you know, it's not, it's not all that great, all things considered. <laughs> Look, I, I told you the story at the beginning of the lecture. I, I've been trying to solve a problem, and I, I really 
done everything I can to try to solve that problem. And I've been talking about what I learned and who I learned it from for 30 years, you know, and that's had a positive impact as far as I can tell on the people to whom I've taught it. And so I, I'm someone who's tried to solve the hardest problem that he could find. The question was, do I think that modern people should have a renewed relationship with religion and God? It's like, yes, absolutely. And, but it has to be predicated on, on higher consciousness, so to speak. And I mean, that ver I mean that very technically. So this is what happened. This is how our religious systems developed. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the very brief version. So if you look at the structure of a chimpanzee troop or a wolf pack, there's an ethic. And there has to be, because otherwise the wolves would tear each other apart. And so would the chimpanzees. So the chimpanzees, in their, in their dominance hierarchy structures, learn how to act out a society, just like the wolves do. So here's a rule for a wolf. Wolf A wants to be top dog, and wolf B wants to be top dog. And so they, they snarl at each other, and they puff out their fur, and they look big and ferocious, and they turn sideways to scare each other. And then one of them chickens out and rolls over and shows his neck. And basically that is the acting out of... Well, I'm a useless supplicant and, you know, your majesty can do what he will with me. And then the proper wolf king says, yeah, well, I might need your useless carcass to haul down a moose tomorrow, so I could tear out your throat, but I won't. And then they both get up and go along in the pack. And so the reason I'm telling you that is because there's an ethic there. Here's another ethic among animals. So if you, if you take juvenile male rats, um, they need to play. They need to engage in rough and tumble play, or they develop attention deficit disorder, by the way, which is quite interesting and something to think about for your little rats in school that are developing attention deficit <laughs> disorder. So if you, if, you, uh, if you take a juvenile rat and he knows he's going to be able to go in a space where he can play, he'll work to open a door to enter that space. So that's how you know he's motivated, because you can't ask him, because you can't speak rat, and neither can he. So, you let the rat go in the play space and you let another rat go in there of about the same age. Imagine one rat's 10% bigger than the other. So what happens first is the rats wrestle. It's not aggressive. They, they wrestle just like Worldwide Wrestling Federation guys wrestle, you know, and, and for many of the same reasons. And the rats will pin each other. And if you pin the other rat, you win. So if you're 10% bigger than the little rat, then you can always pin him. You can always win. Okay, so then what happens is the big rat becomes dominant and the little rat becomes subordinate and they have a wrestling match and then they part. The next time they meet, because it's an iterated game, the next time they meet, the little rat has to ask the big rat to play. And he does that the same way that you ask a child to play, you know, you do your play stance just like a dog does. You can understand when a dog does that. And so the little rat, you know, gets playful with the big rat and then they play. But if you pair them repeatedly, the big rat has to let the little rat win at least 30% of the time, or the little rat won't invite him to play anymore. It's, right, that's cool, that's so cool, man. Jack Yank, Yak Panksepp discovered that. He also discovered that if you tickled rats, they, they giggle, but they do it ultrasonically. So you have to, you have to, like bats. Eh? So he discovered the play circuit. It's a major, major neuroscience discovery. And so there's an emergent ethic in play, a, a, a fair play ethic. and. Uh, there's an ethic that emerges out of social interaction. And then, because human beings are conscious, we watch that ethic emerge, and then we start telling stories about it. We tell stories about the honorable person. And the honorable person who doesn't just win today's game, but wins it in a way that makes everyone invite him to play games infinitely into the future, right? So that makes you the meta player. That's what you're trying to be. You're all, and that's the hero who goes into the unknown, right? It's the person who acts in proper interactions with other people. It's, it's truly an emergent, it's an emergent ethic. It's real, it's more real than anything else. We map that and that's somehow associated with our consciousness. Well, we need to understand these sorts of things in order to put a biological structure underneath our religious thinking again and to tie it into our scientific knowledge and to become awake and aware of these sorts of things so that we can re-establish the foundation underneath our culture. And it's a terrifying thing to do because it does place a burden on people, right? But you want a burden. You, and it's so interesting. It's really... One of the things that's also so cool about what's been happening, I don't understand this. I, I commented on this at the University of Toronto debate. The first thing I did, which, which was unexpected to me and everyone else, they didn't know what the hell I was doing. As I said, I looked around, I said, hey, you know, 80% of the people in this room are men. It's like, 
why is that? Something's going on here. And it's an indication that men and women have different interests. 91% of my viewers are men. What the hell? Why is that? Look at this room. It's almost all men. And men don't come to these sorts of things, generally speaking, right? Maybe because they're stubborn and ornery. But, but, so there's also something specifically in this for men, and, and by, by, by implication for women, because what do you want, useless men? No, you don't want useless men, that's for sure. Although, if you have a useless man, you get to dominate him. And so maybe that's not such a big price to pay for having someone around that you can treat like an infant. So that's the downside of the, of the war between men and women. But a woman with any sense wants a man who's dangerous but tame. Well, I, I could talk, let me talk about the situation at the Ivy League universities first. The question, broadly speaking, covers the, the a question about intelligence and about its diverse manifestations and about its role in selection for universities. If you go back and look at the records at Harvard, for example, in the early 1960s, the typical IQ at, for a Harvard student was about 105 to 110, not much above average, but that's because they were finishing schools for the, for the rich roughly speaking. And, you know, you're, if you had a rich father and he made his money, he was probably well above average in intelligence. But if you were his offspring, there's regression towards the mean, so there's no reason to assume that by nature of your position you were going to be particularly intelligent. Anyways, the average Ivy League student wasn't, was bright, but not outstandingly so. Now it's like 100, IQ 145. Three standard deviations above the mean. Because the reason for that is because they're selected by the SAT, Scholastic Aptitude Test. It's an IQ test. They, they won't say it's an IQ test, but that doesn't matter. It isn't tech, it's an IQ test. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Any, any test that contains a sufficiently diverse range of problem-solving questions that's rank-ordered in, in, in accuracy among people is an IQ test. The correlation's like 0.85. So, and what has happened, there's two things that have happened. I mean, the Ivy Leagues have got more and more selective because they can, and so the average IQ of their students has just continued to move upwards. And then the average IQ of the population has actually increased to a substantive degree too over the last 50 years, partly because, partly, perhaps mostly because of improved nutrition and, and information exposure along, among the, like the more deprived members of the culture.